Hello, um, welcome to today's webinar. We are going to um, get started here in just a minute. There are more um, registrants joining us as we speak, so um, sometimes there are some technical issues logging on. So I'm going to give folks just another minute or so to join, and then we'll get started promptly. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, today's webinar is Fair and Equitable Infrastructure, Investing in Communities and Workers. Uh, my name is Carrie Felton, and I'm a graduate student intern for Heartland Alliance national initiatives on poverty and economic opportunity. Um, I will be uh, moderating today's webinar. Um, we are so excited to be hosting um, such a timely and important topic um, today. So let's jump in. Um, so before we get started, let me just go over a few housekeeping issues. Um, everyone listening to the webinar right now is muted. You can use the chat box on the control panel on the side to ask questions at any time. Um, if you have any audio issues or, or trouble um, like that, we can try and address that um, using the chat box. Also, we encourage folks, if you have questions for our panelists, at any time, please um, enter those in as they come to you using the questions chat box. And we will collect those um, and save them for the end. We're going to have um, a Q&A session at the end um, to address questions. So we encourage you to go ahead and um, send those in as they come to you throughout the webinar. Um, also want to make sure everyone knows that that the slides from today's webinar and actually a recording of the webinar will be available on our website and everyone who registered will get an email with a link to those. So um, if you missed something, you can go back and, and listen again and share with, with other folks who couldn't be here today. And for those of you who on Twitter, we invite you to tweet along with us using the hashtag Equitable infrastructure at the bottom of each slide. Um, also, we have a few handouts available. Um, if you look on your control panel, there's a section uh, marked handouts. There's three things that you guys can download, um, and our panelists will be referring to those during their presentation. We are lucky to have some really great presenters today. Um, these are the lovely folks who agreed to share their wisdom and experience 
um, and insights around how to ensure infrastructure investments are equitable and really benefit communities and workers. Uh, we'll also get to hear some on the ground examples of how this has worked in a couple different communities. Um, so really excited to hear from them. Um, but first, um, let me just share a little bit about us very briefly. Um, so we're a part of Heartland Alliance, which is a nearly 130-year-old human rights and social service organization headquartered in Chicago. Um, and Heartland Alliance National Initi Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity is dedicated to ending chronic unemployment and poverty. We work at the intersection of research, policy, and practice to affect change. Um, we try to be really grounded in um, the experiences of providers and advocates and informed by evidence. Um, so a couple, just to highlight our initiatives really quickly, um, the National Transitional Jobs Network supports transitional jobs and subsidize employment models as a key intervention for people facing barriers to employment. Um, we have the Be More initiative, which is dedicated to improving employment outcomes and economic health of low-income men and youth of color. And the National Center on Employment and Homelessness, which works to ensure that employment in quality jobs is a key part of efforts to prevent and end homelessness. We're also uh, happy to partner with PolicyLink today to present this webinar. And actually, our first presenter is from PolicyLink. And so I'll let her share a little bit more about um, their work in this space. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Lisa Seiler Barrett from PolicyLink. Um, Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Carrie shared, my name is Lisa Kyler Barrett. I'm the Director of Federal Policy at PolicyLink, and we are thrilled to co-host this webinar um, today with Heartland Alliance. We um, consider Heartland a, a partner and an ally and um, are just really encouraged to be working with you in this space. Um, PolicyLink, next slide, please. PolicyLink is a national research policy and action institute uh, where we are focused on advancing um, economic and racial equity. And we define equity as just and fair inclusion. Um, and we use equity as the frame or lens for all of our work. So we believe that an equitable society is one in which all can participate prosper and reach their full potential. Um, our tagline is lifting up what works. And while our organization is based in Oakland, California, we work in communities across the country, supporting and helping to advance policies and practices and efforts that will create conditions that benefit everyone especially those living in low-income communities and communities of color. And as we're in, working in those communities, as we see promising strategies, we work to lift those uh, strategies up, hence our tagline, um, and think about what they might mean at a higher policy level so that they can have greater impact and scale. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to quickly show this slide. One, just to give you a sense of um, the large bucket areas of work um, for po at PolicyLink, I'll give you a sense of the breadth of spaces that we're working in. But at, most importantly, because while we have a specific area that of work that's focused on infrastructure, we actually believe that infrastructure impacts all areas of our work. So you see we do work in equitable economy, within the health space, uh, some work around healthy food and financial security. The Promise Neighborhoods work is a cradle to career strategy. So that's the door through which we enter the education space. Um, boys and men of color um, and transportation equity. We think that infrastructure actually impacts all of these areas. And this is why we think this is a really critical conversation. 
Next slide, please. So why is everyone excited and engaged in this infrastructure discussion? Um, in many ways, infrastructure sets the foundation for an inclusive society. Where and how infrastructure investments and decisions are made determines who has access to the resources and opportunities that can help one advance. Things like transit, getting to and from quality jobs, uh, structurally sound and well-equipped schools, clean and affordable drinking water, um, broadband and internet access, all of these things influence who can participate in society, who gets ahead, who gets left behind, and whose children are most likely to advance. Infrastructure, if done properly, can create conditions that allow everyone to contribute and succeed. Next slide, please. So, a few weeks ago, uh, or maybe longer, um, the Trump administration finally released its infrastructure plan. And not surprisingly, it uh, was weak from an equity perspective. Uh, it does little to nothing to improve the lives for average Americans. Uh, the infrastructure plan was actually released the same day as the administration's proposed budget for fiscal year 2019. And you have to take those two uh, documents or, or outlines together to really fully understand what's being proposed. So taken together, the Trump administration's budget and infrastructure plan would actually harm communities by drastically cutting core funding. For example, for decades, the federal government has provided every state and region with core highway and transit funding through the Highway Trust Fund. The, that fund supports repairs and, and funds construction projects. Trust fund money is often the core component of money that's used by states and regions for their infrastructure programs. The budget proposed by the Trump administration drastically cuts or slashes this core support by $138 billion and then replaces it with a very small pool of discretionary dollars that would mostly flow to states and regions that raise taxes, tolls, and um, other user fees. The budget also eliminates jobs with severe cuts to programs like New Starts, Tiger, and Amtrak. And this reduction in funding means that less infrastructure projects will actually get funded. Um, when you take the plan and the budget together, uh, there's actually a about a dollar seventy cut for every dollar that's invested. Um, so it's not a win for, for communities at all. The plan also further exacerbates the um, existing inequalities. So around the country, families worry about the safety of their drinking water, schools, parks are crumbling, uh, public transit uh, dollars are needed, Modern energy systems and reliable child care are needed, and yet that will not happen under uh, the Trump administration's infrastructure plan. Next slide. Uh, the plan also ignores, based on how the funding mechanisms are structured, it ignores many of the communities that we care about. So, um, the, you've probably heard a lot about uh, P3s um, in this conversation. That funding mechanism many times will not fund the type of projects that are needed in low-income communities and communities of color. And so if you're looking for the major investments to come through that mechanism, that leaves out a whole category of folks that, that actually most need this investment. And then traditionally, Infrastructure investments have been made with the federal government carrying the majority of the investment. And in the Trump administration's plan, it actually flips it so that state and local um, governments have to carry the majority of the burden, which again would translate to average Americans 
seeing an increase in taxes, user fees, et cetera. Next slide. So that's the bad news. The good news is that there are ways to ensure that an infrastructure investment promotes equity by raising the quality of life for everyone. PolicyLink is part of a coalition um, called the Our Neighborhoods, Our Future um, Coalition. And this is a group of organizations that's working along with a number of other organizations, including many of the folks um, on this call today, and we're focused on ensuring that as the conversation and policies regarding infrastructure move forward, they include a focus on equitable infrastructure investment. And to do this, we believe that the investment must adhere to five key principles. Those principles are on your screen, but I'll just review them quickly. First is to go broad. Um, we believe that the federal investment has to go beyond roads and bridges and airports and that it has to include things like access to safe, reliable, clean energy. Um, it has to include broadband access, access to clean water. Um, it should include investments in parks and schools and other community facilities. And we would even say it should include an investment in affordable housing. The second is that infrastructure investment should really be prioritized for those communities and areas that need it most. So we know that there are communities in certain places that have been left out historically from major infra infrastructure investments and need them desperately at this time. We, while saying that, we think those investments should be made in a way that avoids the displacement of existing residents. So we don't wanna see an investment that then pushes people out of the places that they've called home and in their community. Third, we think that investing in projects that deliver community benefits, environmental justice, racial equity, and good jobs is key. An infrastructure investment should raise the quality of life for everyone in the community, and especially those who have been underserved for far too long. The fourth is a requirement that there be transparency and diverse local input. Um, we think that involving folks from the local community is the way that you'll best understand which projects need funding, what are the current needs of that community, and the way that you'll really elevate the quality of life for all. And then last, there really needs to be a priority for public financing and public control. Um, public financing such as bonds, and control should be prioritized over private private fund financing. Sorry, and that's my timer to tell me my time is running up. Um, so I'll just quickly, next slide. Just quickly, um, so earlier I said our tagline at Policy Link is lifting up what works. That means we always want to look to local communities because we think that they have folks closest to the ground have the best solutions. And so here just showing a couple um, examples of places where we think they got equitable infrastructure investment right. In Pittsburgh, a landmark community benefits agreement um, was negotiated in the um, Hill District that brought together 100 community faith and labor organizations um, to win first, first source hiring for construction, um, brought in a grocery store to the neighborhood, and an $8 million fund for community investment. That coalition has also now launched its wa Our Water campaign to make sure that city water and sewer authorities stay in public hands. Next slide, please. The second example is in Los Angeles, um, where the L Los Angeles Metropolitan Transit Authority became the first agency to adopt a construction careers policy. Um, and that policy has resulted in a number of, of wins for folks. So, and you see those on the screen. Um, my time is up, so I don't wanna waste time there. And I know you're gonna hear some fantastic other examples from our presenters. So I just wanna say um, PolicyLink has a number, of, a number of resources related to equity and infrastructure that are available on our website. Um, 
I want to highlight two resources that are actually uploaded um, here for, on the webinar today. One is the two-pager from the Our Neighborhoods, Our Future um, Infrastructure Coalition that sets forth the principles for equitable infrastructure that I mentioned or reviewed. The second is a newly released hot off the presses report on inclusive procurement um, that was authored by uh, PolicyLink in partnership with Emerald, the Emerald Cities Collaborative. And I hope you find these resources really helpful. And I'll just end where I started. Um, infrastructure investment really influences who has access to the resources and opportunities needed to advance. Ensuring that infrastructure policies and investments are made in an equitable manner is critical to ensuring that we raise the quality of life for all. And I'll just end there and look forward to the Q&A. And Carrie, I'll turn back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was a wonderful uh, overview and a really solid foundation of why, why we should be thinking about infrastructure this way and kind of broadening our, our scope. Um, so that was wonderful. Please do download those um, resources she mentioned. Um, so next, we're going to hear from a couple different communities that um, have approached infrastructure projects and, and are actually using transitional jobs and social enterprise models um, to ensure um, that, that these projects are investing in workers facing barriers to employment. Um, and so I will now introduce um, Jess Carroll. Um, and Jess, I will let you um, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Glad to be part of this uh, webinar and uh, appreciate um, the good information that's already been provided. Um, we do play a, a specific uh, role in this space and uh, I'd like to tell you about it, but I'll, I'll begin by giving you a quick backdrop on who we are. Uh, Humanum is actually our parent organization. You'll see under the logos of details and brick and board, a Humanum social enterprise. Uh, Humanum is a nonprofit that's been around uh, Maryland, uh, Central Maryland, for the last 47 years, working with people with various barriers to independent living or employment. So it started with people with developmental disabilities, uh, has extended to people with physical disabilities and other barriers, uh, but um, they started to grow in their presence in Baltimore City and in 2006 began the renovation of the American Brewery Building here in Baltimore which would be the new headquarters for the Baltimore uh, services of Humanum. And uh, finishing in 2009, they really took a look at how they were going to address those, uh, those barriers to employment. And, and as you look at Baltimore in particular, there were so many individuals who were living with the barriers that come from previous incarceration uh, and disenfranchisement. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with the comments already made about how infrastructure has to extend beyond roads uh, and airports and even public transit, although those are huge factors here. Um, it has to extend into access to those things that we take for granted, uh, education being one of those. And so uh, folks uh, in these tough communities in Baltimore um, had experienced a lot of uh, what we would really see now as insurmountable barriers to independent living and employment in particular. And so uh, in an effort to address that, uh, I had the opportunity to connect to Humanum and bring to them a business plan to say, here's a, a social enterprise, and that is a, a way of harnessing market forces to address social issues that could uh, become a solution to some of the workforce challenges that we're facing in Baltimore City. So uh, next slide, please. So we, um, we took a look at, uh, in particular, two problems. One's the employment problem I've already alluded to, and also the fact that Baltimore has something in the neighborhood of uh, 35,000 vacant houses that have come with a decline in our population, dropping from a city of about a million to 625,000. And uh, those houses represent um, a really more symbolic of a problem uh, of disenfranchisement. Uh, there's all kinds of correlations that can be drawn. But the, the important thing to note is that the problem was here. It, it needed to be solved, and that is that those houses needed to be removed, and we still had a problem 
with unemployment, how could we marry up those two challenges and come up with a solution that would address both? Uh, next slide, please. There are, uh, at different times in some of our toughest neighborhoods, up to 60% of the properties that are actually vacant. Next line. The red in this particular photo represented the vacant houses in the neighborhood around the American Brewery Building in East Baltimore. Uh, actually, that slide's becoming dated, and I'm glad to say that, that there are a number of those properties that have now been removed, and that to the left of that diagram, we're seeing some really healthy development as we weed out the bad houses. Uh, private investors are coming in and developing uh, some of the houses that remain and providing affordable housing in this, in this community. Next slide, please. So the question was, how do we, how do we take a look at this level of blight and, uh, and address these problems? Uh, these, next slide. The, um, the neighborhoods that we're serving, and when I first started doing these talks was around 25%. Recent numbers are around 20%, so we're glad for that. But 20% is still uh, abhorrent. And so, next slide. We wanted to figure out how we could um, address both of those problems, and we did that by starting this enterprise called Details Deconstruction. Next slide. We looked at these houses and felt, and if you look at the one all the way to the right, you'll see that those bricks, that's actually either on the surface or behind these uh, concrete surfaces uh, in all the houses. And uh, what we figured out is that if we could harvest uh, enough of that brick and the wood that was inside of it, we might be able to be competitive in going after city contracts that were uh, designed to remove these buildings. Uh, but we couldn't do it in a labor intensive way if we couldn't have a secondary stream of revenue from the harvesting of the bricks and the wood. Next slide. And so uh, we did some feasibility work for a couple of years and then uh, encouraged the city to launch a pilot that we competitively won. And, uh, but we became convinced that the bricks coming out of Baltimore had, an, had a new market and, uh, in the vintage brick uh, market niche. And so we began to take these buildings down and harvest the brick and also the wood inside. Next slide, please. And if you look at the slide in front of you now, uh, th there's wood in there that's, that looks relatively new. That wood actually has much less value. It's the, it's the wood going across the slide that looks old and patinaed. Uh, that is uh, heart pine that was harvested in the south and brought up to build out Baltimore's urban uh, communities. And it is uh, a material that has great uh, value in today's reclaimed market. And so that's usually the stuff that we're, we're mining out along with the brick. Next slide, please. So you can see uh, this is uh, one of the individuals that was employed as a result of winning this contract. We uh, were able to employ uh, almost 30 individuals. In fact, uh, it's bumped between 28 and 32 individuals uh, to satisfy the demands of this particular contract of taking down houses uh, to date, we've taken down, uh, closing in on 350 houses in the city of Baltimore and are on pace to do over 200 a year for the next five years. The, um, the harvesting process is labor intensive, so it creates a lot of jobs, but we didn't want to just create jobs. We wanted to create, you know, good jobs. And so we pay the Baltimore living wage as our entry wage and create a pathway for promotion for everybody who joins us, and then also try to provide support, and we're actually in the process of ramping up on this support to help individuals transition out of details uh, or brick and board and into uh, other industries or into other companies where they may even have a better trajectory financially. Next slide. Uh, just uh, Great individuals, the, the lady to the left who's got the big smile, her name is Bernadette. Uh, before she came to us, she had done two, two uh, terms in prison and she came out, she was virtually unemployable, was turned down 32 times. She, she told me she had applied for 32 different positions, was turned down every time. Uh, she's come to work for us and now she's in a supervisory capacity running crews, uh, a fantastic employee. This is a sample of the wood flooring that we also take out of these buildings that has uh, uh, significant value. Next slide. So 
So uh, just uh, samples of the volume of material we take out. Next slide. Uh, to date, now with three and a half years into this contract with the city, we've harvested over a million bricks and about a little more than 300,000 board feet of lumber and flooring. Our employment goals have stayed pretty consistent. Uh, they've ranged between 28 and 32 individuals supporting this contract. We also have another division that does residential deconstruction and that employs another 15 to 20 people. But since 2012, we've employed approximately 175 individuals. Next slide, please. Um, this just gives you some quick stats and you can reference them later if you decide you want to take this on yourself. Uh, talk to me first. Uh, <laughs> it's been a challenge. Next slide. Downstream iteration of what we've been doing is uh, another enterprise called Brick and Board. Brick and Board is um, where we bring the materials that we harvest uh, and they become the sales arm for our deconstruction work. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, this is obviously a very brief example, but we have developed uh, relationships both on the supply side and the demand side uh, for the materials. Uh, so we've actually developed sources beyond ourselves at this point, but we sell to a lot of uh, local fabricators who in turn uh, supply materials to large companies, um, one, a large one for us, as you'd know, uh, Chicago-based people is Exelon. They have a waterfront headquarters here in Baltimore, and we supplied all the reclaimed lumber uh, for the build out of that, of the interiors of that building to the tune of about 30,000 feet of uh, lumber. Next slide. What we're also excited about, and this is just an extension, is that beyond the uh, employment of people and creating those jobs, which gives people access uh, uh, to an opportunity to build wealth uh, is also the fact that once we take these buildings down, we create green space and in partnership with other nonprofits and the city of Baltimore, uh, we've seen uh, places like this, real beautiful uh, amenities to neighborhoods uh, spring up where once vacant houses uh, stood. Next slide. So there's been a ton of lessons learned uh, but the one thing that I have come to grips with is that it's not, while it's a great thing to create jobs and to find a way to solve in internal uh, infrastructure problems while doing it, um, that ultimately that it needs to be part of a holistic picture and we continue to collaborate with other organizations to try to figure out how we can do more than create jobs, but be part of that community wealth building that gives people a reason to become not just employed, but to live in these communities, to invest in them, to own homes in them, and, and to uh, create a pathway to it. So um, while it's been an incredibly uh, difficult journey, uh, it's also been incredibly rewarding and we're, we're seeing real uh, progress, uh, not in the lives of individuals, uh, but in the landscape of the city itself. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Great, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, such useful and helpful um, information. Um, so we're gonna move on to another community that um, was approaching infrastructure um, through similar strategies. Um, I'm gonna introduce um, our next panelist from Aki, Andrew Simons and John Anderson. They're gonna um, tag team this next part of the presentation. So I'll turn it over. Thank you, Carrie. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Simons. I work for the City of Milwaukee Department of Public Works, and I run the Compete Milwaukee program. The City of Milwaukee, yeah, under the leadership of the Mayor, Common Council, workforce development agencies, and private employers, collaborated to establish Compete Milwaukee, a strategy designed to support both the workforce and the employers in our labor market to provide workforce opportunities leading to family supporting employment while strengthening our community and local economy. To the greatest extent possible, our goal is to meet individuals where they are at and to help individuals identify where they want to go and to help them get there. This is human-centered transitional job programming model designed to, cr to create pathways to employment. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. 
This is a five-part strategy designed to meet workforce needs. Uh, where in the southeastern Wisconsin region, um, using strategies one and two um, help identify the supply side um, meeting the labor market demand. So um, programming is designed around that. And this helps create a pipeline for workers um, ready to engage in their, their next opportunity. And this is done through community work partnerships and transitional jobs. These transitional jobs serve as an access point uh, through the dignity of work. Uh, and it allows underserved or underemployed or unemployed individuals who may have barriers to employment to access an opportunity that they can serve as a stepping stone to permanent family supporting work. So it's a starting point. The transitional jobs provides income in participants' pockets, work experience to put on a resume, and a positive reference. So the city serves as a work site, and they also provide participants with paid career pathways trainings. Mr. John Anderson from WRTP Big Step will share more about this a bit later in this presentation. So if a participant is gaining a paycheck in one pocket, then in the other, uh, John and, and his team are um, through their specialized curriculum, are trying to stuff it full of as many certifications and resources as possible during their time in programming. Strategy five, collaborations. So the city collaborates with a wide variety of strategic, strategically aligned partners. Creating various links allows the city to provide the needed services or education and or resources and, and mentorship um, and much more that, that may be needed. Next slide, please. Compete Milwaukee programming has successfully leveraged, blended, and braided a wide variety of funding sources, including federal and state government, uh, as well as community partners, um, all in an effort to provide meaningful workforce development efforts to Milwaukeeans. Some programming costs are absorbed. Um, I think it's important to note as a whole, operations have maintained very limited administrative costs and most program funds go directly into program participants pockets in the forms of wages for this presentation i'll focus more so on the the latter strategies three four and five um, specifically the adult tj efforts um, in short uh, the city leverages a state-funded program through the department of children and families uh, it's called transform milwaukee jobs and uh, they provide the base wage, the minimum wage, seven and a quarter an hour. The city kicks in, um, similar to what Baltimore's efforts are doing, um, according to the city's living wage. So, a net wage this year is $11.03 an hour. So, that's what transitional job program participants in the adult TJ program receive. Next slide, please. Program goals always to provide a high quality work experience for each individual participant. As part of the programming to provide career pathways on subsidized employment, as much as possible establish and leverage long-term partnerships that match training to opportunities, to increase the level of city services to residents and taxpayers, and to utilize models that work. I think it's important to note um, that, that you should really feel welcome to propose or have any questions for us at this presentation as our efforts are to to network and to learn from others to share our story and to to hear yours next slide please so the city of milwaukee serves as a host work site um, for that adult population they're able to access a, a roughly six month work experience so that's 40 hours a week at that eleven dollars and three cents away an hour wage uh, the work experience uh, as a, a starting point uh, in order to support that, you know, great efforts are go into providing orientations to city staff as well as to workers, um, as well as to collaborate with the various partners to provide resources that individuals can take advantage of. DPW and the city have done a great job of embracing programming and folding participants into the everyday workforce. 
which is a critical component, as is the career pathways, which John is going to highlight shortly. The supplemental workforce allows the city to provide residents with enhanced levels of services, uh, meaning that if there's one person on a, on a truck, a second person can help get the job done. Next slide, please. This is the fifth year of programming. Um, we're excited to venture into this once a year, once again. Back in 2014 uh, in Wisconsin, there was a rough winter and a pretty chaotic spring. So there was a record number of potholes. The city became aware of the transitional job and embraced the opportunity. Back in 2014, uh, we ran what we call a traditional transitional job where the work experience, the positive reference was enough for an individual to leverage to get connected to their next job, their unsubsidized job. However, uh, through our evaluation, you know, we realize that it's not a one size fits all approach. So enhanced supports um, were included into the next year's programming to support someone, an individual, wherever they're at on their career ladder. Next slide. So in 2015, uh, Compete Milwaukee was launched. Partnerships and various strategies were implemented to comprehensively support multiple workforce development initiatives. The adult transitional jobs continued and uh, new models were established, including the Milwaukee Police Ambassador Program. And this programming allows young adult participants to work alongside law enforcement and community members to build stronger and more vibrant communities while increasing public safety. This model is a pathway for future leaders into the police department and similar career fields. In addition, we added an accelerated program through the adult program. I mentioned before, it's roughly six months. It has preset eligibility requirements. And so we created the three months as almost a safety net through our recruitment efforts. Someone didn't necessarily meet that criteria, we could then fold them into a three month program that operated uh, very similarly to the, the longer six month one. In addition, as I mentioned before, the career pathways, the workforce development, training and services were, were added to, to make programming comprehensive to provide that career pathway. Next slide. Here we have uh, one of the first groups of ambassadors, um, and here we have a accelerated program participant. Next slide, please. In 2016, the bulk of that programming remained the same from the adults to the young adults to the accelerated um, with the comprehensive workforce development services extended. Um, in addition to that, we, once again, we expanded and uh, we introduced a urban landscape training initiative, which utilized alumni from previous years. Uh, so it was a continuation of work, an opportunity to, to build additional work skills. And uh, we've partnered with Milwaukee Builds and again, allowed alumni to access as they were exiting their transitional job, uh, a work experience that was responsible for some construction and deconstruction in the, the Milwaukee area, similar to what was occurring in Baltimore. We also partnered with a local agency to provide summer jobs for young adults, and this included various types of job training and employment readiness. And we also provided um, Career Plus coordinators at local high schools. So these targeted high schools received a coordinator to provide some workforce development services and, and served as an access point or a bridge to the, the broader uh, workforce system from the schools. Next slide, please. 2017 and 2018, uh, we, we went back to the core of programming. So we had the adult program, we had the young adults and the ambassador program, and we had the comprehensive delivery of workforce development services through WRTP Big Step. In 2018, we're very excited to help build the next generation of construction workers. So we're partnering with some of the contractors with, uh, with the city of Milwaukee, and they are serving as a host work site for young adults or out of school youth. Next slide, please. Um, so as I stated earlier, I was 
I just provided a brief summary on the city of Milwaukee's efforts to provide various types of transitional job programming with a core focus on the adult program. And here is some demographic information regarding adult program participants. One of the qualifications is that candidates must be unemployed for four weeks prior to uh, applying for the opportunity. Um, and most of the individuals being served are African-American males and are returning citizens. Next slide, please. Uh, challenges, just to, to briefly highlight some of these. Through the course of a transitional job, and we're from the very beginning of recruitment all the way through completion, um, sometimes it's identified that the transitional job is not the best fit um, at that time. And if that's the case, additional resources are, are provided and, and linked to that individual. I think it's important uh, to be mindful of what a correct capacity is. So at the city, we carefully select worksite locations that have supplemental work um, and are good fits for program participants. Folding the transitional job model into the everyday fabric of operations is, is vitally important. So I mentioned earlier orientations with staff. So ongoing efforts to uh, identify key staff members that can provide job coaching and positive construct and in a positive and constructive manner is important as well. The city has done a wonderful job of embracing this, this principle on a daily basis. So through our evaluations, which are ongoing, um, some important elements are the career counseling and casework. Um, would argue that that's, it's a critical component. So that's, that's part of what makes Compete Milwaukee comprehensive. Um, Another piece of that is, uh, in short, the more that participants are around individuals that are communicating the same message is important. What is this opportunity? How do you use it best? What needs to happen next um, so that you can be successful here and at your next opportunity? Um, Human-centered programming is at the, the foundation of our efforts, and it's critical as part of that to simply meet an individual where they're at and, and help support them, again, to where they want to go. So we leverage resources to do that as much as possible, and we seek out new and creative opportunities and partnerships as well. Next slide, please. Some of the successes. So uh, from the 2015-2016 participants, 85 have gone on to gain unsubsidized employment, resulting in over $1.8 million potentially flowing into uh, City of Milwaukee neighborhoods in the form of wages. The Milwaukee Police Ambassador Program has a 100% post-program post employment and education rate um, for all of their 52 participants. The City of Milwaukee is has hired 32 individuals that serve in different capacities. Um, I'm proud to call many of those individuals co-workers. Um, over 366 individuals have participated in, in the various transitional job models that the city has um, supported since 2014. Over $1.6 million in wages have been in funds have been leveraged and over 190,000 hours of supplemental services have been provided to city tax taxpayers through dignity based transitional jobs work experiences. Next slide please. Prior to Compete Milwaukee formally launching uh, the city made a concerted effort to identify strong program partners. WRTP Big Step specializes in our experts in workforce development. The career pathway services are intended for the adult program participants. Generally, through implementation, generally once a month for two to three days a week, uh, individual program participants go to John at the training worksite location. So instead of wearing their hard hats and work boots, they're wearing business casual attire, um, and participants are paid to uh, be engaged in classroom and hands-on training services. Uh, I'll pass the presentation to uh, Mr. John Anderson now.
Thanks, Andrew. I'm not sure how much time we have left, so I'll be expeditious in my uh, presentation. Thank you for going to the next slide. So I do want to mention that uh, WRTP Big Step is a nationally renowned workforce intermediary that's dedicated to connecting people to family supporting jobs. Our primary mission here is to enhance the ability of the public and private sector organizations to recruit and develop and retain a more diverse qualified workforce, primarily in the construction, manufacturing, and other emerging sectors of the regional economy. Uh, our motto is we are industry-led, worker-centered, and community-focused, which uh, we believe helps unemployed and underemployed individuals to be represented and succeed in accessing well-paying careers while exceeding industry's uh, needs. Next slide, please. So just to give you a very quick uh, synopsis of um, how we formulated um, putting together an industry-led um, training curriculum for this project, um, we look, took a look at what the population would be served what would be the various positions and posts throughout the city, uh, whether Department of Public Works, be it sanitation, urban forestry, and others. And then we worked to uh, bring uh, certifications and skills upgrades that aligned with those industries uh, while providing um, some very intensive supportive services. So our process was to first identify the strengths and the barriers of our workers. So we did an intensive industry-led skills-based inventory. So this is really looking for what the person's employability skill set is. We did some academic testing, which is referred to today, but the, uh, the adult and basic education test uh, to test for aptitude. We then derived some employment plans, um, letting individuals know that we were primarily going to focus on manufacturing and construction, but we really wanted to know what they wanted to do post their uh, engagement in the program as a career. So we did some pre-screenings. One thing that was very important as uh, Mr. Simons referenced was the leveraging of additional funds. So we assisted the individuals to get registered for the Workforce Investment Act, which is a pool of federally funded dollars that can help to support and pay for various training programs. Also uh, here in Wisconsin, we have what is called the Food Stamp and Employment Training Program, which individual who is eligible or is a recipient currently receiving uh, food stamps uh, can receive dollars allocated for training and supportive services, which is very important. Those services are, uh, funds could be allocated for work boots, uh, work clothes, uh, transportational needs, as we know the individuals need many supports. Um, and then working with our community partners, we gave uh, referrals for individuals who would need assistance with driver's license recovery, um, child care services, GED, HSED acquisition, AODA and mental health, and including some family literacy. Uh, we're also providing uh, job placement assistance and going to do a 12-month post-program follow-up. Next slide, please. So um, I kind of touched on how the Human Center Counseling goals as applying the various skills inventories and the other assessments to determine where the person's um, job readiness falls. And then that helps to bring in curriculum, uh, such as having them go through um, OSHA 10 safety certification, first aid CPR certifications. Um, we took them through manufacturing essential skills. Uh, what does it mean to work in a manufacturing environment? Entry level construction skills. What does it mean to work into the skilled trades? And beyond that, to work in, as a, uh, in an apprenticeship. Uh, registered apprenticeships, so carpenters, plumbers, electricians, um, family supporting career areas to where not only do they, are they able to take care of their families, but they gain a lifelong skill, which is portable. And that was one of the things that we wanted to come out of this was that no matter what the individual outcome was, when they left, they would better than they entered and they would have an enhanced skill set of industry recognized credentials that would make them more employable. And so we did do work to educate the participants about what are the in-demand and high-wage careers while we were simultaneously addressing their barriers to employment, be that education, be that transportation, be it uh, child support arrearages, uh, things that sometimes individuals don't think could um, preclude someone from being successful and in getting into employment. Next slide, please. As I touched on, you can see here some of the barrier mediation referrals we provided. Once again, um, 
I just want to touch on child care services um, and really talking about child support, knowing that we were going to be connecting individuals, uh, the, our intent to family supporting careers, and they were going to go from no income to hopefully a very substantive income, but we knew they would need to address certain issues such as having uh, child support arrangements uh, that were in line with their current income and then learning financial literacy techniques so they could budget and retain to have uh, uh, healthy families and strong families. Next slide, please. So some of this, the uh, direct training services, once again, entry-level construction skills, manufacturing essential skills, Introduction to apprenticeships. What is a registered apprenticeship? How does one become a plumber, electrician, a steam fitter, a boiler maker? Pre-employment testing skills. Wanting to make sure that their skill set matches the employer's needs and requirements so that they can be in line to pursue whatever their chosen career area would be. Child support 101. Having the person to understand the difference between an order of support and an order of visitation, very important. Job readiness preparation, resume workshops. Uh, through our employment and training navigation sessions, we had various conversations, not only about what did they want to do as a career, but to understand the funding streams that they were attached to, such as the Workforce Investment Opportunities Act, uh, comes along with employment navigation services. There is a person designated to you to help you to access the paradigm of available trainings that you could access. And there are hundreds of them, most of them through your area, local area technical colleges. If they want to go for post-secondary education, not everyone wants to be a plumber. They may want to be a nurse or a nursing assistant. Well, there are funds that if they qualify, that could pay for them to go to school and get their post-secondary degree. So making sure that they understood how to navigate diverse systems of services that they were eligible for. Uh, some other industry-related credentials um, that listed there. Next slide, please. So just an example of some of the additional certifications. The city of Milwaukee has what's called the Residential Preference Program. That is a certification that any contractor who's working on a city of Milwaukee Department of Public Works contract has an obligation to hire uh, on average 25 to 45 percent local individuals. Um, the certification itself is a free process. All the person has to do to be eligible is live in the city of Milwaukee and at the time of uh, getting the free certification, having not worked in the last 15 days or have worked less than 1,200 hours in the preceding 12 months. So in essence, be unemployed or underemployed. The key here is that that then gives them uh, access and, and the influence for the contractors to bring them on to these work sites, knowing that by hiring these individuals, it's going to help them with their contracting obligations and conversely help them gain access to many high wage uh, construction and industry led job opportunities that they may have been excluded from previously. Um, next slide, please. So as Andrew stated, some of our challenges were that in some instances, the participants chose to not take full advantage of the training and resources. And I think that just either came down to either a lack of desire or understanding, or as I like to say, life may have just got in the way. Um, but what we've done is we've let these individuals know that we want them to re-engage. For the next 12 months, we're going to stay in contact with them. Maybe you weren't ready today, but hopefully you'll be ready tomorrow. Through the, our evaluations, we've found that participant options are increased exponentially when they are connected to a broader workforce development system related to funding and the ability to access the continuum of community resources. As I like to say, it takes a village. And so part of one of our partners was the Employ Milwaukee, which is our local area workforce investment board. Um, they control and help disperse many of the resources to access for employment and training through the entire city and state of Wisconsin. So we wanted them to be connected to the broader workforce development system uh, where they could then access everything under the sun that's possibly gonna help move them into a family supporting career. Uh, our successes, uh, we've made over 35 direct unsubsidized referrals to local employers 
such as Harley Davidson, um, Dewey Metals, which was one of the major uh, producers for uh, a major construction project here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was the North Mes Northwestern Mutual Tower construction project, uh, and various others. Next slide, please. So the participants were continuously connected to multiple employment opportunities through our various networks. The city would send postings. Uh, we would use information from our local area workforce investment board, their business services unit. All of the TJ workers were um, enrolled, or I uh, can't really find a better term, in our one-stop centers, which is here, the Department of Workforce Development runs job centers. Well, everyone was registered on a job center. Everyone has an account. Everyone is receiving job postings throughout the state based on their areas of interest, skills, and backgrounds. And then, once again, WRTP Big Step worked directly with employers to engage and them to employ people and to connect people to apprenticeships and the skilled trades through our apprenticeship readiness programming. Next slide, please. As you can see in the picture here, it illuminates. Well, one of our uh, success stories was Mr. Sean Jones. Um, Mr. Jones, you know, prior to his engagement in the Compete Milwaukee Traditional Jobs Training Program, had been, you know, out of steady work for years. Um, he really, you know, got involved with us. He engaged in the career pathway sessions to really understand and determine, you know, what direction for his life he wanted to go. Uh, he gained some certifications forklift training, uh, CPR, uh, and a host of other certifications that made him more marketable to an employer. Uh, through that, he was able to uh, get onto the Dewey Metals Project, which was a joint venture with the uh, Glazers Union. So that was an inroad to a lead for a formal union apprenticeship for him to become a Glazer. Uh, just in case anyone was curious, Glazers install glass. And if you wonder how much they currently make, Glazers here in Wisconsin make $56.44 an hour. So uh, we would definitely consider that being connecting someone to a family supporting career. Um, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I'm going to defer because I'm sure we've probably ran past our time. If anyone has any questions or would like inf more information, as Andrew stated, we really encourage you to reach out to us. We're wanting to continue this great work of connecting community residents to uh, careers and family supporting jobs. Thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew and John. Um, so we wanna make sure to um, have plenty of time to address folks' questions. We've gotten some really great questions in. Um, we have one final speaker, our very own Melissa Young, who's gonna very um, quickly tie together some of the equity principles that you heard um, Lisa talking about at the start. Um, we also have uh, put together our own uh, equity principles around infrastructure um, that Melissa will touch on uh, briefly to kind of pull it all together and then we'll uh, do some questions. So Melissa, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. And just really quickly, I just want to thank so much Lisa, Jeff, Andrew, and John for joining us um, on this webinar today. And a very, very special thanks to PolicyLink um, and the team there for um, their partnership and co-hosting this webinar. Uh, we know they have a lot going on just like we do, and so we're grateful for their partnership. You know, before we talk a little bit about the principles um, around uh, fed, uh, fair and equitable infrastructure investments, um, I want to tie a couple of threads together um, from our perspective at Heartland Alliance. Um, you know, as a human rights service-based provider, we absolutely know uh, that place matters. Um, we know that the communities in which Americans live determine their access to quality health care and nutritious food and good schools and affordable housing and safe banking and lending institutions and employment opportunities, just to name a few. And we know also that the reality is that not everyone in America lives in the land of opportunity. 
um, we know, as Elisa pointed out in several different ways, that infrastructure is truly the foundation on which um, people uh, gain access to economic opportunity um, in many, many different ways in their communities. Um, we also know that large American cities and metropolitan areas, including the suburbs, remain far more economically unequal by income than the nation overall. So again, place matters in doing this work. And infrastructure and the ways in which we are investing in infrastructure in all of its forms um, disproportionately impacts individuals living in poverty and um, puts economic mobility even further out of reach for many, many individuals. The good news is, um, is that there are plenty of jobs to do. Um, as Lisa articulated in different ways, um, we know across the country that there are a myriad of different ways um, that uh, infrastructure investments in land, um, in broadband, in uh, affordable housing, in transportation and other things could create um, a number of different employment opportunities and also have ripple effects in terms of improving health benefits, safety, and other things in communities. But we also know that these investments ju don't just happen by accident. They are deliberate policy choices and funding choices. And so from our perspective at Heartland Alliance, um, we know that any infrastructure investment really must include a myriad of ways and on-ramps into employment opportunities and good jobs, um, including but not limited to all of the things um, that our presenters talked about today subsidized employment, transitional jobs, access to social enterprise, um, pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, um, access to education and training and the support services that many of our presenters talked about today, and many of the ways in which the programs um, and the initiatives in local communities are connecting the dots um, between employment and economic opportunity within infrastructure-related jobs um, and other systems of support. Uh, next slide, please. And so as Carrie flagged um, a few minutes ago, at Heartland Alliance, we have a few um, uh, principles for fair and equitable uh, infra infrastructure investments um, that are on your screen in front of you. Um, many of these um, uh, principles reflect very much the principles that Lisa articulated earlier and that are reflected in all of the presentations that we heard by our community-based our community-based partners on the webinar today. Um, we fundamentally believe believe that um, infrastructure investments must contribute to thriving communities. Um, we saw this in different ways um, through, our, uh, through our presenters' examples of the ways in which um, we are deconstructing uh, vacant homes, but then constructing um, vibrant uh, green spaces for local communities. Um, that's one really great example of the ways in which we're creating and supporting thriving communities through infrastructure structure investments. Um, we also recognize that these uh, investments must invest in communities and particularly low-income communities and communities in color, of color. We know over and over again, um, again, that place matters and the ways in which we have not invested or divested in low-income communities and communities of color have created historic marginalization. And so we need to be deliberate about the ways in which we invest in infrastructure and particularly in, in low-income communities. We also believe that uh, infrastructure investments must promote long-term economic well-being of individuals. And we saw this over and over in many of the examples that we heard today, the ways in which infrastructure investments are supporting pathways to employment and economic opportunity through good jobs, the connection of uh, and on-ramps into jobs, but also the tying together of apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, training and education, and barrier, barrier removal supports. Um, this is part and parcel of the way that we believe we do good and quality and fair, and fair uh, infrastructure investment in local communities. 
And then finally, I'll just tee up um, that we believe very strongly uh, that infrastructure investments should do no harm. Um, Lisa articulated this principle um, in a slightly different way um, in her presentation, but we believe very strongly that infrastructure investments should not displace um, individuals and communities and should not put communities at risk um, as we think about investments um, in different ways. Um, so I really thank you all for joining us for the webinar today. I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie um, to lead us through some of the Q&A portion. Great, thank you. Um, so we got some really great questions coming in throughout the presentation. Um, we'll answer a couple of those um, and then we'll wrap up and any questions we don't get to, um, we'll address after. Um, again, the slides and uh, recording will be available also as well. So um, even though we're um, at the end of our presentation, if you have more questions, please um, continue to send them in and we'll address them afterward if we don't get to them. Um, so my colleague Katie Schnur is going to um, moderate this Q&A section. She's been collecting the questions throughout the webinar. Great. Thanks so much, Carrie, and thanks um, to all our wonderful panelists today. So we have a little bit of time um, for q and I just want to let folks know who submitted questions um, that Jeff, unfortunately, had to uh, jump off the call before we could do the Q&A. So I will direct any questions that were specific to him um, just over email. Uh, so that being said, um, we had one question come in uh, that I think is related to um, kind of enforcement, for lack of a better term, of equity principles. Um, and I think I'm going to open this up to uh, Lisa and John and Andrew, because um, I believe you probably have some experience or insight into this. The question is, um, how do you continue to hold the kind of lead stakeholders of major infrastructure projects to their stated equity commitments? For example, to commitments around hiring, um, setting aside slots for apprenticeships, procurement, and employment pathways. So a little bit about how we hold folks accountable um, in these settings. So this is John Anderson, WRTP Big Step. Um, I would make reference to um, the fact that um, we try to operate at a level that would allow us to influence conversations um, and whether that is encouraging the use of a PLA, which is a project, project labor agreement which um, or referencing to the residency preference program, which is an existing city of Milwaukee certification that states that contractors are required to utilize a certain amount of community residents. Um, and then uh, doubling back on that to work with the entities that monitor those same um, programs for performance, um, but offering technical support. So rather than pointing a finger and saying, hey, you did not meeting your goals, um, our approach would be, it appears as though you may not be meeting your goals. What can we do to help you? Um, given the fact that we are just connected to a continuum of training, resources, eligible, qualified, skilled workers, um, it's usually not that hard to find a skilled worker for an uh, employer to employ. Um, but it may take some additional effort. And so um, I think it's just from accountability, it is being a part of the conversation at the ground floor and being active throughout um, the life of that project is, is essential. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, did you have anything to add there based on um, your own experience with some of these projects? Um, no, I'll just add, I mean, I think I agree with all of that, and I'll just say, point back to the principles that I highlighted, and the fourth one was around transparency and diverse local input. And so I talked about it in terms of um, making sure that the community is engaged and, and they're able to provide um, information about the types of projects that are needed in their community, but it also is critical for this accountability function. 
um, so that if the community is involved in the decision making and the planning and design and the um, uh, to procurement and, and implementation, they are holding that project accountable um, to what was outlined um, at the beginning of the project. And so that is one of the additional reasons that we think it's really critical when infrastructure investments are made that there be a requirement for diverse local input and transparency. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, that came in, and at this point I'll just direct it over to the Milwaukee folks, is uh, do people experiencing homelessness or recently housed people participate in your programs? If so, are referrals to the programs part of integrating employment and housing systems? So that's a great question. The answer is yes, certainly. Anyone who meets the minimum requirements for programming can come in and benefit from what it has to offer from the wage to the services. So if early on uh, through the process, if an individual identifies, you know, this is my barrier currently, what can I do? Then efforts are made to engage them in the appropriate networks. That includes John and his staff at WRTP um, and or leveraging the continuum of care um, or seeking out additional resources, which, um, which are, it, it's done. We, we do do that. It's, you know, it's, it's about meeting someone where they're at and supporting them with what they need immediately. So, um, and then part of that conversation is um, as practitioners identifying what's available. So, you know, John's an expert at, um, at, at certain networks and um, to the greatest extent possible, expanding those individually and connecting and collaborating um, to the greatest extent possible so that we can we can serve someone with whatever needs they may have. Yeah, uh, this is John. If I could just piggyback off of what Andrew was stating. Um, for example, uh, WRTP Big Step convenes a group which is called the Community Workforce Partnership, which is a group of 13 other community-based organizations. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis to align uh, resources and to strategize around how we can continue to include uh, community residents and all of these projects that are going on. Um, one group in particular, which is referred to as the C Central City Churches Group, is actually a group of 30 churches under the head of one particular church. And so just through that one resource, we can connect with them and then connect that person to some direct resources as they may be connected to a particular group or clergy group. Um, also through the available community resources here, um, we are blocks away from what is uh, Community Advocates, which is a local organization that actually works to serve the homeless population. And so one of the things that was essential to us in the whole design and implementation was knowing that we needed to have these resources to bear because we understood the population that we would be serving or we wanted to serve, but we had to be prepared to address almost every and all barriers to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, this question is also for um, our Milwaukee folks. Would it be possible to speak more about how transitional employment opportunities are identified? Are there any incentives for the employers? Well, I know John can talk about the networks that they have at, at WRTP. Um, one, you know, city employment is always a goal for many individuals entering into it and entering into in, into their transitional job. And so uh, laying the groundwork, uh, meeting someone where they're at and saying, okay, well, first, well, here's an example. So someone came into programming this past year and uh, he, he didn't currently have his driver's license. So John engaged him in driver's license recovery. Uh, he had to go through considerable effort um, going even down to Chicago to pay off some tickets and even tickets in his son's name because he was a junior. And he said it didn't matter because his goal was to work for the city. So we also provided him during this time a CDL class because that, you have to have a CDL permit at time of applying. So in advance, we're providing the classroom training and, and 
variety of resources. Um, so he gained his CDL, he had gained his driver's license, so the combination of them um, allowed him to be eligible to apply, and he started working for the city uh, last week. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a great success, and, you know, we, we try to provide that pathway, but not everyone's interested. Um, so, John, and uh, one of the reasons the city chose WRTP is because they're, they're at the heart of manufacturing and construction. And there's a there's a lot of that happening in this local area, so I'll let John pick up from there. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So I would say beyond of uh, all of the wonderful you know certifications and the work that we poured into individuals to uh, make them you know job ready or more advanced uh, with their skill sets, is as I made reference to the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act, um, which is primarily through our partner, Employ Milwaukee, which is our local area workforce board. Um, under that auspice, through the employment navigators, those individuals are actually also eligible for OJT, or on-the-job training dollars. So the business services unit um, employees, or I should call case managers, I guess I should call them, who work directly with the TJ workers, are able to uh, work with and negotiate with an employer to offer them um, these on-the-job training dollars, which would offset the cost of the employer bringing on a new hire, an initial employee. So beyond the fact that, as Andrew stated, we've already given them a heightened skill set, and, and coming in the door, you think, you know, they just want to take them, but sometimes employers do need a little incentive, as you use the word, or some encouragement. And so uh, by linking and tying those types of resources which they're already eligible for and making it prevalent to the knowledge of the employers in our community, uh, we feel that was an additional incentive for employers to hire. Great, thanks so much. So um, before we wrap up the Q&A, I just wanted to ask um, one last question that came in. So um, throughout the webinar, you know, we started off talking about what's happening on the federal level and then digging into some of the local program examples that are embodying some of these fair and equitable principles. So I'm going to open this question up uh, to Lisa and also to Melissa. Um, and the question is, how could these local examples translate into federal policy approaches? to equitable infrastructure investments. So how can we take lessons learned on the ground in communities um, and apply them within the national context? Oh, and um, it looks like Melissa accidentally hung up the phone. Um, so Lisa, I don't know if you are there um, and are able to speak uh, to that question. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, but Melissa uh, raised this during her presentation that um, it's it's great to see that there's already alignment um, in sort of what we have proposed in the principles that I lifted up and the ones that Melissa lifted up, obviously, they were very aligned, but and the work that is happening on the ground, I think, extracting you know continuing the dialogue and connection and making sure that the conversation at the federal level doesn't get divorced from what's actually happening in happening in communities is really critical and taking any additional learnings that are coming out um, that perhaps we don't see reflected in um, the conversations that we're trying to move at the federal level um, and making sure that those get included. Um, but I would say um, it, it felt like as I was listening to the presentations here today and as we've been talking with folks in um, various communities that that we think have been successful in um, advancing equitable infrastructure investments, we are in fact already trying to take what they're learning and, and have tried to include those in the principles. If folks think there are things that that are missing from those principles or um, experiences on the ground that um, are not reflected in the principles that you think are critical or would love to hear that feedback and and my email was um, on the slides but it's lisa cb at policylink.org um, again would love to hear that feedback 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Carrie, who will wrap up our last few slides. Thanks, all. Thanks. Um, thanks again to our wonderful panelists. Um, it's always a shame on webinars that we can't do like a round of applause and have everybody here, here be able to clap. But um, it was a great presentation and I also thank all of our attendees today uh, for taking time out. I know that each of you is um, invested in this work as well. Um, so here is our last slide um, with the contact information. I, I believe each of our folks um, welcomed um, more contact questions, feedback from each of you. Um, share, sharing the wisdom is wonderful. We encourage that so much. So um, thanks so much for, the, for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Boom. Yeah. Oh. Great job, John.